Well, thank you for joining us, uh, except for Sebastian, I forgot your blue shirt. <laughs> and uh, so it'll be okay though. Um, so thank you for joining us. You are all doing farming automation, essentially, automating various aspects of the farming process. Uh, but this is Berkeley, not Davis, so we may have to explain a little bit about agriculture, plants and stuff. Uh, so maybe you, you, we could just really quick, you could tell us what the problem is that you guys are solving with your automation. Yeah, I, I think um, if we kind of look at the, the current state of ag, so if you look at the way wheat and corn and soybeans are grown, they're, they're very automated. They have these giant machines that are doing every step of the process, including harvest. And so you have these like almost robotic farms already. But $200 billion worth of fruits and vegetables are still picked by hand every year. So there's this super expensive manual activity. And the labor that does this work is disappearing. People figured out that these jobs are basically really terrible. They're not willing to do them anymore. And so we need to automate. Um, so we have this really enormous need. And robots are the right solution for it. So that's like definitely a big challenge. Uh, for us, like we phrase it in a um, slightly broader um, way, saying that on the one hand, we need to drastically increase food production. Uh, over the next 20, 30 years, population is going to continue to grow. And so we need to uh, make food production catch up with that. But on the other hand, we have those tremendous sustainability challenges. So we need to be able to grow much more food in the next um, two or three decades but using drastically less natural resources. And so what we, the, the problems we're particularly interested in are typically around how do we grow drastically more food with, with less uh, water, less land, overall less natural resources. And robots and AI can uh, drastically help in that. And yours is weeding, correct? So we're building an um, autonomous farming platform to help farmers perform farming action at the plant level. So our goal is to help them increase efficiency. Um, and we're starting with weeding processes, right. which are today very, um, not only very labor intensive, but also very um, chemical intensive. I didn't mean to minimize the, uh, <laughs> the quality of your effort with it. It's just weeding, right? But that's, <laughs> yeah, it's it just is, weeding at the end of the day. It is a but very that's, important That's where part. we start, yeah. Yeah, and, there, and you're getting into more, uh, more domains, which we'll talk about later. Yeah. And Michael Pica. Yeah. Um, so we're solving a very like specific part of ag, which is uh, what you do when you have to spray a crop and the ground is either wet or the plants are too high. Um, so usually you can drive a tractor through a crop and spray it with this thing that has these huge booms. It's uh, kind of slow but really cheap. Um, so when these other conditions are true, you actually have to fly this enormous airplane over the crop and spray it with chemicals from the plane. Um, so crop dusting, obviously. Yeah. Um, and we're building basically autonomous electric crop dusters that are, um, well, they're way, way safer to operate because there's no person in them. Um, they're a whole lot more precise. Um, so they solve what's really a pretty substantial issue, which is like you want the chemical to go onto the field. Uh, you don't want it to drift away and like go onto a school. Right. And unfortunately, that happens kind of a lot. And our, our planes don't do that. Uh, so I think, it's, I think it's great that you guys are all these great early stage companies taking on farming. This is like, but why, why farming? Why now? Why agriculture in, in, with, with robotics? Like, is, did you guys all have the same dream one night and you're like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wake up and start a, make a startup right now in the year 2017 or 18? Like, what made you decide to start these companies now rather than a couple of years ago or wait until the technology matures or the need is greater? So for us, the, the urgency came from um, the sustainability concerns. Like we, as a society, need to find ways to drastically cut on not only CO2 emissions, but also on our overall impact on uh, ecosystems. And agriculture today is a major contributor uh, on, on, on this impact. So our motivation came from realizing that that's one of the biggest challenges that humanity is facing. Uh, let's, find, let's try to find ways. And, we actually didn't start by wanting to build robots. Like we started by really focusing on the problem. And we kind of discovered robotics as a very powerful tool to address those issues. Yeah, and I, I think um, another aspect of this is the development of technology over the last decade has really finally made this possible in a way that it wasn't before. So we have neural networks getting a lot better. 
GPUs and, and CPUs getting a lot more powerful and a lot cheaper. Uh, even the cost of robot arms and cameras is coming down a lot. And so what we're seeing is it's now possible to solve these issues with robots, and it's economically viable. Um, so just to be clear, Traptic is building strawberry picking robots. I think I forgot to mention that before. And um, what we're seeing with this is, is with the cost of the components where it is now, it actually makes a lot of economic sense for us to be building these machines. So even while running Harvest as a service, we'll be able to pay back our capital expense in six to seven months. So that means because we can pay off our capital expense quickly, we can run this as a service in a way that's really beneficial for the grower and in a way that allows us to scale our business really, really quickly. And Michael, was there like a sale on batteries in your yeah, electric, yeah, exactly. electric aircraft? Uh, yep, really cheap batteries. <laughs> um, yeah, so for us, uh, obviously same deal in terms of like um, most of the underlying tech is just becoming at least somewhat more commoditized. Um, so you're, you're able to build things without having to develop like the whole suite. Um, which is helpful. Um, but for us in particular, ag, uh, it's really it's that we want to build airplanes to move people someday. Um, but the hurdles to do that are just like ridiculously high. Um, regulatory hurdles are extremely high. The technical hurdles are really, really high. Um, and so we wanted to find an industry where we can use the same technology, um, but, but deploy it in a way that's both like very economically viable and also super safe. And so AGS is very unusual space for aviation where uh, you're, you're performing, you know, like a really difficult mission with the plane. Um, but if something goes terribly wrong, probably no one's going to get hurt. Right. Except the plants. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, Lewis and Sebastian, you guys both have pretty robust computer vision systems in your robots because they need to be able to find the right ripe strawberry and locate it exactly or decide which plant is which and you know get in there to cut it or whatever. Uh, but then you also both have these manual tasks of getting in there and touching the plant in one, you know, nicely or not so nicely. Uh, which, which is harder, the, the recognition or the interaction? I would say for us, um, our team is split 50-50 between the two. So in terms of where our end power goes, it's, it's about equal. The grasping is super hard, especially with strawberries. You have to be able to, and with a lot of other fruits and vegetables, you have to be able to pick the berry up. You have to be able to rotate it by 90 degrees so that you bend the stem uh, to a 90 degree angle. And then you have to apply a great deal of force to snap the stem of the berry. So the amount of force you need is equivalent to about 20 times the weight of the berry. So you have to have a really, a really firm grasp on the berry, and you have to do all this while being very delicate because the, the berry has a soft skin. So we had to develop a custom gripper basically entirely from scratch to do this, uh, which was quite challenging. Um, so that manipulation side is something that we focus on really deeply. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm sure Sebastian will talk about the computer vision side of it too. <laughs> you, can talk about, you can talk about the cutting too. So, so the hardware side is definitely extremely difficult, um, for sure. I think for us, it really depends on like what's the goal. Um, if the goal is to um, exactly automate a process that currently is already happening on the field, um, for us, uh, that's not only the case. So if that's the goal, then the, the hardware component is sometimes one of the hardest uh, things to solve. But where we see the biggest value in the long term is actually in everything else. All the stuff that we are not capable of doing today on the field, which are enabled by um, AI. So the, where the computer vision technologies really comes into play for us is not only in automating the weeding process, which we're doing today, but also starting to be able to do much more than that and starting to be able to, for instance, detect diseases or insects. Yeah. Things are today are impossible to even think about. So short term, the hardware component is definitely a very hard uh, piece of the puzzle to solve. But longer term, most of the value will come from the algorithms. Right, and it's a more multifarious. Like the, the problem is more complex in a way. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested of that in that idea of the sort of plant doctor rolling along, you know, reporting back on that. Is that how far out is that? Is that like five years from now you're going to be able to say, oh, this plant is at 60% of this and has this parasite? No, we we're, we're not very far away from that. As a matter of fact, like the all the tasks that we're automating today are designed to be um, crop specific. 
So what we call crop specific is every single crop leads to a particular decision that's optimal for that crop. So for weeds, for instance, the first process we're automating is um, killing weeds. Like we obviously um, target only the weeds, not, not the actual uh, vegetable crops you're trying to grow. Um, but when we start thinking about disease control and insect control, all, all of the applications we are, we are developing are crop specific. So in some sense, it's already the case. Gotcha. Uh, so Michael, the, you have a, a, different, a different challenge with basically building a plane from scratch, uh, which sounds pretty hard, if I'm honest, but you did it so, you know, tell us, <laughs> tell us a little about that. Like what was, you, did you really just start writing down like plane ideas? I mean, I did that when I was a kid, but. Yeah, yeah, uh, yes, definitely <laughs> writing down some plane ideas. Um, I've been into airplanes since I was like five, uh, sort of obsessively building them. So in many ways, it's this lifelong trajectory that's gotten me to building these planes. But the tech challenges, um, they're very numerous. So I mentioned that there's kind of commoditized technology. Um, that's true, but in the electric aviation space, unfortunately, it's not particularly commoditized yet because no one's made much of a business out of electric aviation. Right. So there's these core components like subsystems of the plane that we've had to develop ourselves. Um, so probably 90% of the plane is custom. The batteries, motor controllers, motors, all the uh, like core avionics is custom. All the software that runs on the plane is custom. Um, but that's also just sort of part of our culture. We're very much a like tech, heavy tech company. And so why, maybe you can explain why you want to go with a winged plane rather than a multi-rotor. Yeah, Because yeah, that, totally. that seems like, multi-rotors seem, I've seen solutions that like, this is a great option for yeah. spraying or whatever. So why go with wings? Yeah, so um, I think broadly speaking, the multi-rotor, you can think of multi-rotors as like a platform that has been solved at this point. Um, you can use it, it's fairly easy to use, it can complete a variety of missions, which is super cool, and that's why they're widely deployed. Um, but from an aviation perspective, a multi-rotor is a like, fairly mediocre vehicle at best. Um, and just in terms of metrics, basically, to move like a pound of stuff a mile, it takes about four times as much vehicle to mm -hmm. do that with a multi-rotor than a fixed-wing plane. Um, so what we're trying to do as a company is basically uh, be the, the first company in the world to develop like a very, very short takeoff and landing fixed wing aircraft and turn that into something that's analogous to a platform that can just solve very complicated missions in a really robust and reliable way. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's better for the mission, but a whole lot more technically difficult. Uh, speaking of technically difficult, uh, we'll continue with you with the regulation side of things, which yeah. I imagine you guys have had to deal with regulations in one way or another, but like, with flight, with flight over areas where there are people, even if it's large fields and stuff, I imagine it's just been a nightmare. But I understand you are the first to have a, uh, what is the exact uh, approval that you got yeah, that you're yeah. um, rightly so proud of? So the, the approval is, is basically just, we have approval to operate a large um, autonomous aircraft for commercial purposes in a wide scale way. So basically anywhere in New Zealand we can operate commercially. Um, there's no other company in the world that has that approval, which is very exciting. Um, in terms of, do you have a question about what the challenges behind that were? Yeah, so yeah. I mean, like, it's just like getting to, you know, running an autonomous big plane yeah. over large distances. I would, I would say no, right off the, I'd just say yeah. no. Yeah, so the challenges are really, um, one of, the biggest one is that it's, uh, it's just a whole new domain for regulators. Um, so we needed to find a regulator that was creative enough and, fl and flexible enough um, to creative try and, regulation. <laughs> yeah, to try and like wrap all of our heads around what you need to do to make a safe product in this space. Yeah. Um, so we actually did it in New Zealand. There's a really, really cool group of regulators there. It's a small group um, who we've been working with for about two years now. Um, and yeah, it's, it was it was a really extensive process. It involved. Um, a ton of load testing, uh, flight testing, sort of subsystem level testing. Um, but yeah, I, it's, it's pretty cool. We're basically sort of the pioneers of that process at gotcha. this point. And for you guys, I imagine there's not only just, you know, regulatory issues, but the question of actually what, get, getting out there and, and executing and trying these things out in the real world versus in the lab with your lab strawberries and your lab weeds. You gotta get out into the, the real farms. 
So, so, so please tell me. The, the regulation <laughs> aspect of it is also um, quite important for us. Um, very similarly, the, the current state of regulation uh, that covers robotics in farming is actually pretty immature, as you can imagine. So you, we have to work very closely with regulators um, to define that regulation um, over the next few uh, year, over, over the next uh, few years. So the regulation question is is a big one. And then the um, getting the machine on the field. Luckily for us, like the regulators we're uh, talking to are quite um, open-minded, and so we are able to prove that if we work safely on certain, on an, under certain conditions, we can deploy and start deploying our robots on on fields today. Yeah, and you know, our experience has been uh, the economics of our service, even with a human driver, are still really good. So we haven't needed to do the self-driving piece. So that makes this substantially easier. Also, at the same time, farm equipment is really dangerous. There's like literally these like thousands of pound like metal things with like exposed spinning blades that are just being dragged through the field. This is like par for the course in ag. So as long as our machine is not more dangerous than that, it's okay. Um, <laughs> Our experience, so our experience has been that, that regulation in ag is, is surprisingly minimal. Um, in our case, the one thing we do think a lot about is food safety. So yeah. we've designed our machine to be totally food safe, but then there's a question of like, how do you validate that? And um, especially in produce, the main force for food safety is the fact that certain grocery stores, like especially Costco, require that farms are certified by these third-party food safety auditors. So these third-party auditors are like the main force for food safety compliance in ag. So what we basically what we've had to do is to work with these auditors to make sure that that they're happy with kind of the the level of design and the cleaning procedures that we've put into this. And there's there's a, a fair amount of work involved with that, but um, on the whole, it's been pretty straightforward. Well, I'm glad to hear that at least. Uh, so I want to change gears a little bit here. Obviously. In any, in any industry, automation brings up the question of labor and the labor that's being replaced by the automated aspect, uh, or if it is being replaced. Uh, I know you mentioned that there was a labor shortage, and of course also that this labor is backbreaking and not preferable for a lot of people, but still, like a berry-picking robot replaces a person who picks berries, and that's sort of a fundamental thing that you have to wrap your mind around, and if you have ethical qualms about it, I'd love to hear about those. Yeah, so this is something that we've thought about basically from day one. I mean, I think when I told my friends I was going to start this company, every single one of them asked about this. So it's something we thought about very early on. Um, the way we're going to deploy our service is basically um, we're going to deploy a machine that picks a lot of the berries and then have humans pick the rest. So really, our service will augment the existing workforce. So we go in and allow growers to grow more berries with kind of the same or shrinking workforce. Um, but what we're seeing is that there's such a severe labor shortage in ag the strawberry growers are literally, literally leaving parts of their field unharvested. They're literally leaving berries to rot on the vine or on the plant just because there's not enough people available to do the work. And this is really because it is truly horrible work to do. You're literally walking around for 10 or 12 hours a day, picking stuff up off the ground. It's very damaging to people's bodies, and really people can only do it when they're young. So this is like really work that we don't want to be doing. And so it, it makes a lot of sense. I think a lot of the ethical issues you might see in some other industries, we really don't have as much here. Yeah, I think a lot of the premises of robotics in agriculture are around making workers more productive. That's definitely true. I think there are also a lot of um, a, a lot of value that goes beyond again, like just automating tasks that today exist. Uh, the the examples I mentioned earlier around this is the, this is detection, but overall around more data driven processes in farming. All of those things are. Um, it is progress that goes beyond just automating tasks. Um, so one of the biggest challenges around labor that we're seeing is more um, how do we train the existing workforce of the, the, the workforce that is currently um, working in, uh, on farms, how do we train that workforce to be able to manage the types of equipment that we're bringing to market? That's, that's one of the biggest challenges we see um, around labor. Michael, do you have anything to say to the, yeah. the crop dusters? Y yeah, yeah. Uh, well, crop dusters out there, we want to work with you. Um, but uh, 
Yeah, our plane sort of ironically actually uses more labor uh, per acre. I than, was curious about that. Than, yeah. a, uh, than a normal airplane, <laughs> and you might be thinking, okay, this this is a terrible idea. Then, <laughs> um, luckily, it's so it's it's both a very different kind of labor, um, and also just the economics of crop spraying are are pretty different than these other things where the airplane itself is the primary cost component. It's not any of the labor. It's mm -hmm. the, the planes consume a huge amount of fuel, really high maintenance cost, et cetera, so we get rid of that. Um, yeah, so for us, uh, there, there's no qualms of we're taking jobs, we're actually making some more of them. Um, it's more questions of kind of what you were alluding to, like who are these operators gonna be? Um, you know, we need someone right now who can like SSH into a Linux laptop, um, which you don't, usually find on a farm. That's yeah. Pretty, yeah. yeah, that's pretty rare in, in <laughs> yeah, farm yeah, yeah. today. Increasingly though, yeah, I suppose my, uh, my boss at the beginning of the day said the farmers are among the, the biggest early adopters of technology out there. Do you find that to be true? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, like, farmers ha have needed to adopt um, technology ever since like, the tractors appeared that, like, be, like, about a century ago. So there are very technical people um, they're used to repairing machines all the time, um, uh, even adjusting or customizing them for, for a lot of them. So farmers are um, really tech savvy in that sense. Um, when it comes to new technologies, computers, and, and like data-driven processes, um, it's not necessarily obvious, but most of them are very open-minded. And yeah. so it, yeah, it makes it not that challenging. The other thing we've seen is that these growers are growing a commodity on very narrow profit margins. And so what that means is that if they don't run their business in like a very optimal manner, they won't be able to make a profit and they'll go out of business. So all the growers who are still around today and who are still growing are growers who have been very aggressive about minimizing costs and maximizing revenue and really running their business in an efficient way. And so that means that if you can demonstrate that the service you're providing uh, will improve their business, they actually adopt very quickly. Um, so they're, they're, they're very, very good about adopting uh, technology like that. And when we see a problem as severe as the labor shortage they're facing, um, it's easy to show how we can make their business better. Yeah, and I think for people who are offering a service, it's an easier sell, too. Um, so for crop spraying, for example, it's like rather than calling, uh, you know, X crop spraying person, you may instead call PICA. Um, so it's, there's not a super high barrier to entry initially. Um, and that, that helps significantly. Gotcha. Well, we only have about a minute left, but I wanted to ask you very quickly, what, what is the, the technical aspect of your creations that you are most proud of? Just like, like awesome wing design or like my, you know, the, the material we made the gripper out of or whatever. Like what is, what is your favorite part of your giant cool machines you built? I think it's been really incredible that we've built a durable robotic platform that's been operating in the field every day for a year. Yeah. I think that's, that's a part of it. Maybe it's not quite obvious that that would be super hard, but actually it's really incredible we've managed to pull that off. Yeah, I was basically um, about to say the, the same thing. Like, You're going to copy his answer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, they're bringing the, the level of precision that, you've, that we have already know in other industries, like manufacturing or healthcare, Bringing that to the field comes with a lot of challenges. And being able to keep that same level of precision, but also match the level of reliability that you need is probably uh, one of the biggest challenges. Gotcha. So your answer is the whole thing. Your answer is the whole thing. <laughs> How about you? Mine was going to be the whole thing, too, but I don't have any time. So uh, <laughs> software? Software. <laughs> OK, the software. software. <laughs> the software part's hard, too. All right, well, we're out of time. But thank you for joining us. Uh, I look forward to seeing all your stuff out on the farm. That's awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.